Hello, I'm uh, Ashley Quinto Powell. I'm going to um, present on salary negotiation for women in tech, but I'm actually really excited uh, to, pre to present in a single track conference. Uh, because, first of all, we have the good ones in this room, the ones who are going to treat women in tech fairly, the ones who are going to make sure we have all of the opportunities that we should. Uh, and just out of curiosity, <clears throat> how many of you have ever accepted a job uh, without negotiating? We're like, that's a great offer, I'll take it. <laughs> okay, so th that's everybody. Uh, so meet my friends, Dick and Jane. They both apply, this is a very anecdotal uh, example. For the record, less based on science and more trying to get you mad at the situation. So um, both apply for jobs as junior software developers and they get offers for $50,000 a year. Good job, guys. Jane says, thank you, I can start in two weeks. She was really hoping uh, for 50. Dick says, Thanks, but I was really hoping for something closer to 60. So let's say he gets 55. They split the difference and they say, well, we want you, we'll, we'll give you half. And she's already accepted at 50 because she's a sweet Midwestern girl who uh, wants to be nice to everyone. So he's making 55, she's making five. Then because the entire world is totally fair. They both receive fair blanket 5% increases each year. And after two years of hard work, there's a pretty big difference. He is making 6637 and she's making 55125. Took her two years to get where he did with asking one question. So the difference between there is 10%, it always was, but he's making 5512 more than Jane. What could you do with $5,500? So I would go on like a pretty kickin' tropical vacation personally, but you do you. Um, at the next stage, <laughs> both enter the job market looking for jobs as now experienced web developers. If we set it up so that asked, asked about job salary, remember Dick was making 6637. So he's going to answer, still truthfully, uh, I'm making over 60, or he might even say I'm making mid-60. He could say I'm making in the 60s. She's going to say what? 55. 55, right? So if, she's, if we like really give her credit, she says 55, 125. She's really honest. They're both really honest. A, he's saying I'm 60s. She's saying 55. So if, if they're asked about the job, job uh, the salary history, and they're that far off, and then Jane doesn't negotiate again, it's not that far off that Dick would be making 72,000 now at the next job. She's making 58. That should make you mad. So if everything else is fair in the entire world, we're responsible for this part of the wage gap. This is the part that we can control and the part that we can change. So a little bit about me, I am Ashley Quinto Powell. Uh, I've been in technical consulting sales and sales management for 10 years. Uh, I have $14 million in personal career sales. Um, I've placed over 100 consultants on assignment. I have managed high performing sales teams. I've negotiated rate with clients on behalf of consultants. So what I do now is everyone who wants a consultant from where I work, Bendy Works, uh, the negotiation comes through me. And I have negotiated rate with employees. And then most recently I negotiated my own rate uh, when I switched companies. So now I'm at Bendy Works. I negotiate directly with clients. And I had an odd path to Bendy Works. So I really, I uh, wanted to leave the job that I had been at. I had been in there a really long time. I was doing two full-time jobs at once, like a lot of women do. And uh, I just wanted to do one full-time job at a time. And um, I really wanted someone to rescue me from this terrible job. Uh, I was looking for really one thing. I was looking to stay in my field, which is technical sales. And I wanted someone to pay me six figures. So 
Sales jobs are a little funny. You can make six figures. Everybody says you can make six figures with the caveat that it might take you a couple of years. I'd been at my previous company for eight years, so I had a really solid commission history, and I could reliably be making six figures there if I stayed. And I could go almost anywhere, and they would say, yeah, 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 you can definitely make six figures here just when you get going. And I wanted to say, no, 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 I have a mortgage, so, and children who like to eat and be clothed. So you have to, you have to keep me um, online with what I'm making. Uh, so for me, it was really rescue me from this terrible job um, and keep me where I am. But luckily, I know enough not to go to employers with that value proposition. The value proposition that I went to employers with was I sell between two and a half and three and a half million a year. I'm really confident that I can continue doing that for you. Uh, so I read this book, John Acuff's Quitter, uh, which is about going off on your own and starting your own company. Um, and I wasn't about to do that, because I'd already done that. But um, what really helped is that he said something really important about who your boss is when you tell your boss that you quit. Well, your spouse becomes your boss. What are you doing all day? Your mortgage company becomes your boss, because you need to pay that. Your credit cards become your boss. So you're not actually free because you don't have a boss. You have a lot of other bosses that nag you more than the boss you thought you hated. So I knew uh, from this book, I, it really gave me um, the strength to stay where I was, even though I hated it, to their credit, they let me stay while I looked. And I looked for nine months. It was really picky. So I said six figures it was a very, very, very bold statement for me. Um, because as a job seeker, you are often put in the unfair position of having to name your range right up front. So that is not um, an accident. They, what they do is they are asking you, essentially, what is the lowest that you will take to accept this job? And you say to yourself, well, I want to get my foot in the door, and I don't want them to exclude me based on this number. So I will give them like the lowest, and then we can work it up. You can't work it up. So what I did is I said, no, it's got to be six figures. And a lot of people said, well, thanks, but that's not what we're looking for. Now, here's another way to look at it. When I'm talking to a client about um, what BendyWorks rate is, I actually want them to know sooner rather than later. Because um, it helps establish that we're talking about the same level of consultants. So the, the developers at BendyWorks are all very, very senior level engineers. None of them are junior level. And if we're talking about senior level engineers, then you will be thinking the same rate as I. And if we can establish that we're way off, then we're not talking about the same engineers. So it's less that you think my consultants are overpriced. It's more that you were thinking I was talking about $25 an hour guys offshore. It's a way different consultant. That's fine. You can go hire them. And then when they mess up your code and you're ready for us to repair it, we will still be here and you know our rate. So think of yourself the same way. If, if you're way more expensive than another company, you're not talking about the same role. You want a senior level role, for instance, and they're looking for a junior level guy. Or worse, they're looking for a senior level guy who's willing to say he takes the rate of a... It's good. I think you just talk to him. It happens. Uh, who has the rate of a junior level guy. So I took all of the negotiating tricks I'd done for consultants and clients and let them work for me. So the first thing I did is stack the deck. Here are some ways. Try to garner multiple job offers. So the best way to do this, actually, is not to be amazing. It's to take more chances. So uh, a f um, somebody was telling me about a friend of ours who had, like, in succession, uh, applied for one job and gotten it, applied for one job and gotten it, applied for one job, and, which is great, I guess. But I think that he probably was overqualified. That's why he got that job. You should be rejected from a lot of jobs. So um, when I was looking, I wanted to apply not to five, I wanted to apply at 50. 
Maybe I want to apply to 75. The amount that you need to put yourself out there is way more than you think it is. So what you want to do is you want to give yourself so many chances that a couple of job offers will come in at one time. This will absolutely be a numbers game. That's a really popular thing to say in sales. Everything is a numbers game. Uh, but your job search needs to be a numbers game. Wherever possible, don't need a job. When you arrive at a negotiating table needing to leave with that job, you take all the power away from yourself. And you have a lot of power. You need to know your worth, too. So you need to know exactly how much you're worth, not how much you need. That's a different question. Uh, and not how much you were paid last time. But you need to know how much you're worth today. So really great resources on this are Glassdoor.com. I use this all the time. Um, ONET Online is actually a government-sponsored website that tries to bring all of the uh, jobs in all of the industries and all of the job titles and understand what the job duties are and what their salaries are. Then we should ask. We never ask. So I worked in the consulting world for a really long time and the recruiters that I worked with were tasked with find over and over and over and over and over again finding new consultants. And uh, they would say things like, this is so great. She is totally a needle in a haystack consultant. She knows what she's doing. She has this great experience. She's just going into the consulting world, and she is cheap. Uh, newsflash, nobody's going to tell you that your rate is far under market. They're going to go cha-ching and hire you. So salary will be based on merit not need. And I think, um, and, and I know, when I talk with women about how to negotiate for salary, oftentimes they will think to themselves and say, well, I need XXX. And that is you working down how much you'll accept. So that's, you're working on the bare minimum that you will expect. We need to elevate this game. What, like, so far ahead, because um, we're worth a lot more, and we can make more, and, um, the boys are making more. Also, a rarity of skill means a longer job search. So just be prepared for that. Mine took nine months. I was hoping that it would be like a hot three weeks. But there are not salespeople like me around, really. There are a ton of junior level salespeople. And there are a ton of uh, mid-level salespeople. But I said, I'm not, one, I'm not either of those. We're really senior salespersons. I'm going to sell two and a half to three and a half million dollars for you a year. So by that standard, six figures, sort of a deal. That was a joke, you guys can laugh at that. Okay, so talking to recruiters is a great challenge that we deal with a lot in the tech industry. Um, as we keep our friends close, I want you to re keep recruiters much, much closer. So here's how recruiting works, if you were not aware. Here is what you make. And that is what the client pays. And this, in between, is recruiter gravy. So this is, this is fair, actually, because a recruiter um, goes through and does all of the work. They connect you with this job that you didn't have access to before. They're speaking on your behalf. Uh, they're really um, making sure that you look good in light of the, in, in the, in the client's opinion of you. Um, but so you wouldn't, this is, this is worth it, but you have to be aware that this is where they make their money. Now, a recruiter will never, ever, ever tell you uh, that you're coming in with what you want to make is less than what the client is willing to pay, because that would eat into what they make. So they ask you, you tell them. And if you're too high, they'll certainly tell you. But if they go too, if you're too low, they'll go cha-ching and hire you. Um, another great thing to be aware of is ranges. People give ranges, and they don't understand what they sound like. So in this instance, what are you looking to make at your next job? Well, I'm looking to make um, 55 to 75,000, depending on benefits. Now, when you say that, what you believe you have heard is, or what you believe you have said is, I want to make 75,000. If your benefits are incredible, they can bring my dog to work, and you have a slide in the front room, and there's a gym on premises, and we get five weeks of vacation a year, then it'll be a little closer to 55. 
But what, but what an employer hears is I'll take 55. So right off the bat, when you give a range, you've just given the lower. Don't even bother. Or if you're going to do it, say I want to make 75 to 125. There are, there are things that offer non-monetary wiggle room. So uh, there are ways to negotiate um, if, for example, you're not going to take health insurance. If you know ahead of time that you're going to be on your spouse's health insurance, that's something that can, if a, if a company is able to look at the total package, that's something that you can wiggle with. Uh, PTO, they can give you additional PTO. That's something that you can wiggle with. Flexibility, and on and on and on and on and on. The thing is, you don't want to get, give any of this up in the first round. This is all second round stuff. Uh, some fun quick tips. Uh, if you are uncomfortable arriving at a negotiating table with someone and having a face-to-face -face or phone conversation, just don't do it. Force them into an email communication where you can like think about um, if you can think about the email. Um, I cry sometimes when I get really frustrated, which is really not, it doesn't give you like a leg up. Like, please employ me. I'm sobbing uncontrollably. It really doesn't. So if you, if you have to do it by email, just do it by email. Um, don't accept an offer on the same day. Just make this, like this is, the, if this is the one thing that you take out of this talk, don't accept an offer on the first day. Uh, make an excuse. I have to talk it over. Uh, I w I'm looking at something else. Uh, I'm temporarily dead. Just don't, don't accept the offer on the same day. Um, because you want to give yourself time to come up with ideas, like come up with non-monetary things that you can throw in. Um, and to also to give yourself some guts. Um, pretend you're negotiating on behalf of your family or pets. For women in particular, they tend to devalue what they're worth but they don't devalue their kids. So that's something that I personally use. I have these like, really beautiful children and a really handsome Paul Bunyan type husband. And if I'm negotiating on their behalf because they like private school and uh, you know, Paul Bunyan shirts, uh, <laughs> then uh, I am gonna, I'm gonna negotiate harder than I would just on my own. Um, your value is highest before you start. So you are, um, you're going to, I'm going to break this to you, but you're going to arrive and they're going to realize uh, that you do things that they don't like or you have annoying habits or like you eat someone's yogurt from the refrigerator or like, I don't know, like you like Emacs and they think that's really dorky or like whatever it is. There's going to be stuff, but right now, ahead of you starting on your first day, you're literally a perfect person. They went through all these people and they said, this is the one we want. We want this guy. And, and you're there to say, yeah, I want to work with you, but let's make that work. You don't have any power um, to negotiate it once you start, so do it on the front end. But also, your image to them is just better before they get to know you. Like, no offense. You'll get embedded and then they'll like you more, but you know, there's a, there's a period where you are a hot mess. Um, you're also the only one in the negotiation focusing on your shortcomings. So in a negotiation, what happens is that you tend to be, to be repeating to yourself all of the reasons they're not going to give you the money. Well, it's because uh, you don't have a CS degree. Uh, it is because you don't have experience uh, on mobile. It's because they're not focusing on any of that. They're focusing on all of the things that you do have because they went through a pool of applicants and they decided that you were the perfect person, that you were the, the best one but you're focusing on all the reasons they're not going to give you the money, so stop that. Uh, and they're coming to you because they need your help. They actually want you on their team very badly. That's why they're making you an offer in the first place. Go you. So let's talk about how to negotiate a raise when you're already, uh, when you're already there. Um, it's good to come into a boss with lots of numbers and lots of evidence. The nice thing about being in sales is that there are numbers always available to me, it's for good or for bad. Uh, about how I've done in the past month, quarter, year. 
You want to come and you want to bring lots of evidence about all of the important projects that you have worked on and all of the things you have done and all of the things that have made that you have made uh, money for the client, done something really cool, solved a problem. Uh, you want to have all of that evidence. Don't talk about what other people make in the meeting. So a really a perfect per place to ask for a raise is often in your annual review. Your employer is planning on that. And I have in, previously in this talk suggested that you talk about what everybody else makes, and I still think you should do that. But I don't think that you should actually bring those concrete examples into this meeting. It's just going to make your boss super angry. Um, you also shouldn't say the word super. It makes you sound like a teenager. Um, <laughs> Uh, leveraging another offer is a really tricky way to get a raise out of a current employer. So every, like everyone has heard this, this uh, uh, maxim that if you are looking and you get another job offer and you go to your current employer and they, they counter offer, you're not supposed to take that counter offer, right? We've all heard that. Your employers have heard it too. Um, what, what you say when you go in with a counter offer essentially, whether you realize it or not, is I've been looking and I don't like this place. So a better way to do it, you know how we're all being poached on LinkedIn all the time? Um, n communicate with those recruiters a little bit. So you want to, so like what I do is I go, I'm not interested. I'm too expensive. But just in case, how much were you thinking? And then, and then you can take that, because it's a lot more polite to go to your current employer and say, hey, I really enjoy this job, but I got to tell you, I'm getting a lot of messages from outside, and they're saying that I can make $25,000 more, and I don't want to leave, but hey, that's irresponsible, right? That's a way different way to say that than like, hey, I've been looking and interviewing behind your back. All those doctor's appointments? Nope. <laughs> so just be, be, really, just be a classy person about that. Okay, um, if you're in the nonprofit world, a lot of times um, you hear like, um, how can you possibly ask for that? Like we're, we're all working for the mission. You know we don't have much of a budget. Uh, you are already working for the mission because you work there. And you could take your skills to a for-profit institution and make more. And that is not something you should be made to feel ashamed of. That is something you should be very proud of. And uh, we should approach it like that. There's a lot of guilt in not-for-profit. Uh, you're already working for the mission. OK, so um, I really hate uh, when people say, you should do this, and then they leave you with like all of this theory, but not how to actually do it. So here's what you should actually say. Uh, that's a good offer. What more can you do? So like, if you're not going to do anything else, this is super easy. I sound like a teenager. Um, what more can you do is just puts it on them. Like, great. I think that's wonderful. What you want to get to, so this, this salary negotiation stuff is not about like beating up, beating each other up. It's not, um, you're not battling. It's arriving at a, uh, at a negotiating table. That's all it is. You just want to get to the negotiation table and you'll get more. Okay, I was really hoping for something more like X. Can you get close? So this offer is for 65. I was really hoping for something closer to 75. Can you get close? Um, just asking, do you have some room to negotiate? So some companies won't have any room to negotiate. You'll know that they don't have any room to negotiate because they will start telling you what the salary is like immediately in the process. Recruiters are specifically trained to, if there's not room to negotiate, they will, they will say, really early, this is, what you're, this is what we're going to offer you. Is that OK with you? And I've actually, i got to be honest with you, I've worked in those environments. There's still wiggle room. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah. I'm looking at two offers side by side. I actually prefer yours. Can you beat this other offer? Nothing gets people fired up like a little competition. OK, and that's the end. Uh, yeah, I do. I, I have um, probably no time for questions, but. <laughs> well, we have break coming up, so you could take them in. Okay. What do you do about the research that says that women who negotiate are perceived more negatively? They're perceived as bitches. I mean, there's there's some pretty pretty recent, pretty 
on uh -huh. clinical research about that. I yep. mean, that if you negotiate on your raises or even on your initial offers, that you are going to be in a worse position once you're hired. Every single part of that makes me a little angry, stabby angry, actually. Sure, here's the, here's the thing. No, but because you're not going, remember, you're not going into battle. You're just creating a negotiation space. So you're, all you're saying is, and you're doing it really nicely. I really want you to sound like me when you're up there. Like nothing I said was aggressive at all. All you're going to say is, that's a good offer. Thank you. I'm so excited. Can you do a little bit more, though? Because I'm looking at things that are higher. Right, that's, that's all that is, is saying to someone, I want to work with you, I'm, I can't say yes now, but here are the things that would allow me to say yes. When a client wants to negotiate with me, I think that's great. When they say, I don't like what, what you're offering me, and here's why, I, 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 that's exactly what I'm looking for, because instead of telling me no, they, give me, they, make, they allow me to turn it into a yes. So, and also, I don't care who calls me a B word. I just don't. Well, sure, I don't either. No, because you know what? You're not my. Extra work life. But I mean, it doesn't. I, you know what? My boss is here. <laughs> I, I went to my boss before he was my boss, and I said, if you can't pay me six figures, I can't work for you. That's kind of B wordy. But luckily, he said, oh, I want that B word to be on my team. Thank you very much. And thank you to all the good ones. I appreciate that you're here. Did you ask more questions? Sure. In a half an hour. I just want this uh, answer on video. Uh, do you have any advice for uh, when a company, when you're seeking new employment, when a company tries to block you in and after they start this offer within one day, when especially you talk about like trying to stack the deck? Yeah, that's ridiculous. You don't need to accept that in one day. I mean, that's unreasonable. That, you know, because that says uh, that that company doesn't care about your family. I mean, if, if my husband accepted a job offer without talking to me, he might not have a wife when he got home. That's ridiculous. And you can't be expected to make a major life decision in 24 hours. So, you know what, they can say it because they have all the power. But do you want to work for someone who has no respect for your family life? And I would actually say it like that. I would say it probably more politely, but like I have a family. I'm not capable of making a decision this quickly. I, need, I like to think on things. I'm a careful person. So I think, I think it's unfair to put you in that position, but it probably, um, it probably says more about them. Thank you very much. <laughs>